good everyone welcome to the stoa today we have our friend jacob lung fisker returning to the stoa uh, jacob is the author of early retirement extreme uh, also has a blog of uh, by the same name uh, and i'm a big fan of jacob's work uh, and his first session at the stoa was really good um, so I was begging him to come back, please, Jacob, please come back to the store. And he says, okay, I'll think about it. Uh, and he circled back to me uh, a few months later with this epic title, uh, and I'll read it, solving big and complex problems by designing for emergent movements with post-consumers philosophies, subtitle, how to transition into a solution to the meta crisis without waiting for agreement or products to materialize. And I love the title, but it doesn't meet the YouTube character limit. So we came up with uh, uh, the title that you saw on the SO website, Resolving the Meta Crisis with Emergent Movements and Post-Consumerist Praxis. Uh, and anyone who geeks out about STOA stuff is going to geek out about that title. And um, I had a sneak preview of Jacob's presentation. It's uh, I'm pretty stoked about it. It's really good. Uh, so I am very excited about today's session. Uh, so how's it going to work? I'm going to take Jacob in a moment, and he's going to um, share his uh, screen. Uh, and it's going to be about a 60-minute presentation. Uh, we're here for 90 minutes in total, uh, and then we'll have a 30-minute uh, Q&A. So if you have any kind of questions that are coming alive anytime, put them in the chat. I will call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask your question to Jacob. This will be on YouTube. And if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that. And I'll read your question on your behalf. Uh, so that being said, uh, Jacob, welcome back to the store, my friend. So I'm unmuted now. All right, cool. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. Like, no pressure, right? Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'll try to share my screen. Okay, of course that didn't work. There we go. Is that good? All right, yeah. Then. Um, yeah, so uh, Peter and I had a little bit of, uh, oh no. <laughs> let's, doing that. let's see if it holds, holds solid here. And we don't, we don't, I can't, I can't talk that fast. Right, so so Peter and I had like a little bit of a battle on the on the title. Uh, I, I came up with what I thought was like a super descriptive title. I like like these Victorian style paragraph length titles, uh, but apparently there's like a 100 uh, character limit on on YouTube. So uh, my original suggestion was over the limit. So I tried to reword like you know like 20 times uh, and get it under the limit. So that was the first limit here. So resolving the meta crisis. Uh, I'm going to talk about something a little bit. Let's see if this works. Yeah. A little bit more general, namely uh, solving big and complex problems. So the reason, of course, we have big and complex problems is probably because of the meta crisis. So it's it's all included in this. So um, the title has three components, which I think um, pretty much uh, cover what I'm I'm going to talk about. And one of the pertinent points, or very important points here, is if we're going to going to make any inroads and in solving anything, we need to be considering all three of them simultaneously they always need to be be on our mind and um that the the, the meta crisis is in, in in to a large degree a failure to actually do that it's very easy to forget when once you dial down on one of them um so the three lines uh, um they cover the personal uh let's see do i have a cursor you don't know cool okay so i can point um the personal for which is about the post consumerist consumerist praxis and by post consumers i don't really mean something super specific about this i mean more like non consumerist as in like non 20th century philosopher style thinking uh, stoicism would be obviously be an example of that um, the emergent movement part is about the societal component and the big and complex problems is about the terrain so to speak or the map of the terrain um, or problems underlying, uh, problems originating in, in, in that aspect. So um, as, as Peter explained in my previous presentation, I mainly talked about the personal and how to use systems theory to build this kind of like a, a resilient lifestyle for the 21st uh, century with a specific praxis that 
was a way out of uh, consumerism and as, 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 which, as a side effect had uh, the, the, the side of which which had the side effect of very early financial independence and early retirement. And that was a fairly good carrot. So I decided to lead with that and call the whole project, so to speak, early retirement extreme. But very early on, it also, I also had the interest in on, on trying to change the world on, on a broader scale. So it was also realized that there were emerging properties to these ideas. Uh, and so I've also been like blogging back when I was doing that. I was laid on the forum talking about um, the other ERE. So we, we, we stuck with the acronym and the other ERE is the so-called emergent renaissance ecology. So like once you decide an acronym, you're kind of limited in what you can call it. And that is what that concerned what would happen if more people started adopting these individual ideas. So this presentation is, is mainly going to be about uh, expanding the perspectives from individual solutions to aggregate solutions, not just what, what I've done, but what, what one can do in a more general sense. Um, so let's start, this, start the show by returning to, um, let's see, yeah, bingo, to a question about big and complex problems that um, I got um, at, at the end of the last pro, uh, presentation. So, Someone asked after after doing this whole talk about like individual resilience. Someone asked. Uh, I had kind of anticipated uh, that that there would be a question about community resilience, so I had prepared a, a bonus slide to explain why I thought that was a much more difficult problem to solve. And um, okay, um, and I think the way I, I mean the way to go here is to realize that people are very different. They have different uh, cap capacity capacity for scope. So there's this graph which I first saw in uh, one of the limits to growth books, uh, describing essentially it's probably not the first one. I'm guessing it's one of the second and third after they've been working on like solving all the world's problem for a while, realizing why it was so difficult to get people along with it, and so. The graph in the in the center here describes uh, individual people and and what their concerns are, not what they are technically capable of. If they like walk th through the problem, I mean, people can understand a lot more if you sort of sit down with them and explain, well, this is a problem. But then, like next day, it's all forgotten. So this is a, the dots describe what people would spontaneously think about all the time. So if we picked like a, a random random dot here, well, uh, this one's random enough. Um, then, um, yeah, I, unfortunately, okay, yeah. So some someone this dot rep would represent a person with national concerns over a period of say a few years. So this might be like a politician trying going for election. So they're thinking about this this kind of scale, and they would have a a, a scope or capacity for understanding complexity that lies somewhere in this band. And likewise, um, someone like. Here, this this point here might be a person whose main concern is friends, family, mainly family, maybe some colleagues, making plans for like the next six, seven, seven, eight years. That might be say like a grad student going to PhD school. Um, one of the aspects of humanity is that most of the dots are down here. That's just a, like a, a, a fact of nature, so to speak. So in general, the the main um, focus of a random person would be sort of on family and friends, you, 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 can, you can even see this in like, a, say, advertising, you know, you got to buy this product to make your friends and family happy or keep your friends and family safe. It's not something about, well, you got to build a nation or you got to be concerned about the world. These are like different concerns. And, and, and similarly, you know, like, thank God it's Friday, you know, we don't say like, thank God another century has passed. We don't really have any understanding of deep time. So most of the dots will essentially be down here. Um, So, uh, sorry, I lost the track here. Okay. So, what we cannot control with increasing scope is essentially people's temperamental preferences. Uh, and in, in my response to the community resilience problem, I pretty much picked two extremes, uh, mainly the, namely the, the individually oriented temperament and the socially oriented temperament. And these would be characterized by going along the x-axis for the for the for the socially oriented and uh, the y-axis for the individually oriented and so if we start like i did in the last talk which was mainly about individually oriented um, resilience um, 
I pretty much start by becoming aware of the problem or a problem or the problem or the meta crisis, the predicament or whatever you will. And then you probably get excited or you don't. And then you learn a lot about it as an individual. You read books and you go on, on Google or whatever. Um, you might, might even take like a class or something. And then you design an individual solution around that. And so you're essentially increasing your scope of this access. And once you've learned enough, you, uh, you design your individual solution, you implement it. And first, you've developed some kind of uh, individual resilience and self-reliance. And at that point, you think, well, it would be cool if we had some other people to go along with this. And so you try to form a community. At this point, you're probably up here somewhere. You know, you've, you, have, you have plans you work for for decades, skills and so on, supplies and whatever, proper style almost, uh, financial plans, you know, you know pretty much how you're gonna, like every contingency you can possibly imagine. Then you wanna go with and say, it would be nice to have some community around that, but you, you, the problem is you have to increase your scope in this direction so much in order to get over here. And so in practice, it, it, it rarely becomes a thing. Uh, you, you make some attempts and then eventually you give up. I mean, trying to develop community out of a bunch of like individually oriented temperaments is like herding cats. Uh, conversely, if you go to a more socially oriented temperament, um, that would be like the green meme of spiral dynamics. Uh, usually the way it goes is people become aware of the problem. How do we fix it? Well, immediate uh, spontaneous sort of impulse is to let's form a community, you know, like let's gather people and so we can learn as a community and then once the community has learned things you know gone through say like a facebook group developed and having, having had these con conversations for a long time uh, there's a spin-off let's refocus on a solution and design a community solution but the, they eventually when it comes to implementation they have exactly the same problem as the individuals have um, because expanding the, the, the time scope, so to speak, from uh, the present or even next week, you know, like let's meet weekly and discuss this, but to, to like, let's plan this for a year, for a decade, again, revolve, it involves generating massive amounts of scope. It's, it's an entirely different ball game. Um, the immediate um, response to that might be, well, let's, um, Let's call for like an increased level of human consciousness. Like let's let's like focus on adult development, become more spiritual, which essentially means appreciating these wider these wider connections more. I need to point with my my mouse mouse, mouse pointer, not my finger. Um, but the problem with that approach is that a it's like extremely hard. Uh, in in uh, I like Robert Keegan's book, In Over Our Heads, uh, the final conclusion is dedicated. Uh, it kind of mentions that we might not even live long enough for this to happen, as in like people simply do not become old enough for enough of us to reach like Keegan 5 or Keegan 6 or something like that, right? Um, the other thing I would say is that we can't really control the direction of scope development as such, uh, as people develop say spiritual consciousness or become more involved we, we we cannot make sure we cannot be sure that they'll go tangent tangentially i mean instead of focusing on com community people might start focusing on the entire world instead of going this way up uh, and of course it's not extreme but uh we cannot control the direction so so what 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 is one to do right so the first uh, first impulse usually is to think of uh, when, when you're facing some kind of big and complex problem, um, is, uh, should, I, my, um, should I go to graduate school? I mean, I run, a, I run a forum that is mainly about the ERE, sort of like on the individual basis. And there are often people who like try to find, find themselves or figure out what to do with their lives. You know, like, should I go back to grad school? Is that a thing to do, right? And so for those who are interested in that, I usually direct them to two places. One is the uh, phdcomics.com. Uh, and having, having been there, I could say at least like 20 years ago, this was all, every, everything you read in that comic strip is true. So you see everything there. Uh, but the better way of uh, explaining the, um, what, a, what a PhD actually is, is uh, Matt Mites Illustrated Guide to a PhD. And if you Google that, you'll find it. So it's a little bit more detailed than, than what I'm presenting here. But I, I, I thought that way of thinking about it was, was like really good. So I'm gonna like use and abuse that idea. 
So the, the, the big white circle here pretty much comprises all of humanity's aggregate information. So that's what you'd find in libraries and notes and R&D groups. And I would say it's not really only academic knowledge. It could also be like the combined, you know, mass of YouTube videos, everything that's written down in a sense somewhere, the books and so on. If you want to be more general about it, uh, you could go to like Ken Wilber's uh, Orkwell model with all quadrants, all levels, all lines. So that's kind of like that. So it, that expands this from just the, uh, the academic circle here to internal work and cultural work and so on and so forth. Um, the distance from the center kind of indicates uh, how much time, how much scope has been spent going in a different direction. So what Matt might is uh, saying is that we all start here in the center with uh, whatever this color is. That signifies kind of like what we learn in, element, uh, in elementary school. And so that's our knowledge base. And then we go to middle school and we, uh, we expand it and then we know a little bit more. And then eventually we graduate high school and we have some kind of foundational understanding of of, of, of the world. And then if we go to college, and again, it doesn't need to be college, it could be like a professional school or something like that. We decide on some kind of specialization, that's a purple thing here, and we build out in some direction. And then if we decide on a master's, we, we, we put that on top of here, that's more of the same. And uh, if we go to grad school, we read and read and read, we're working our way out here until we finally reach the uh, perimeter here. Now we are one of those who know the most things about a very, very tiny aspect of reality. And the next step is that we push, push through. And that little bump out here, that becomes our dissertation. And so we write that down and publish a few papers. And as, as everybody does that, uh, the infosphere here slowly expands. The result of that is that uh, we have the best libraries, uh, but Outside our field of expertise, which is extremely narrow, we still communicate in 140 characters and memes. Um, we have extensive knowledge about pretty much everything. And I should say, when I say we, it's like it's, it's that you can find that knowledge in a single person somewhere. But I mean, when I was when I was in grad school, and even as a professional physicist, I mean, it was often so that you could not even have deep conversations with the people in the same office because you was, you was one with one person was working on black holes, the other person was working on neutron stars. And while it's both general relativity, you know, the differences are still so big that the amount of shared knowledge was not big enough. And so it's very hard for us to generate any kind of agreement about what to do with it, because there's nobody to know, it's hard to find people to agree with because they don't know what you're talking about, essentially. Uh, and so as a result, we have a very large number of unsolved crises uh, in the world. So, oops, I seem to be stuck. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's look at that in, um, in a little bit more detail. Um, how does an individual construct their, their reality, so to speak? Um, and what forms the basis? How do they develop knowledge? How do they develop their ego and behavior and so on? So I'm, 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 I don't really have any formal background in, in sociology or psychology or anything. So I'm just going to use the standard computer metaphor for all this. So I hope, I hope it's not, it's not going to offend too, too many by being like completely wrong. So this is, this is just a metaphor of, of, of one way to see it. So in that sense, our identity and our um, knowledge, behavior, the way we make sense of things is constructed by installing little software packages, uh, which comes in different forms and shapes. Uh, that could be like parameter values, various scripts, the way we behave, you know, like I say, hello, how are you? And you say, I'm fine, how are you? You know, that's a script, various routines and habits, um, various frameworks for understanding things that's more detailed. Um, whether we are capable of formal operations, we might learn logic, you know, but is, it, is, it, is the logic strong with us, so to speak, or do we like mainly sit with like concrete uh, operations? And all this is installed onto our hardware. It's kind of limited in that sense by our temperament and intelligence and things like that. And those are probably set by some various neurotransmitter levels in the brain. And all this happens in a, in a very path or in environmentally dependent, so a very idiosyncratic way. And it's not always successful because there's no real plan for it and everybody is different. So it's actually kind of hard. Um, so the arrows here, and I almost, 
I, I started making all these diagrams with arrows, but it, it, I almost wish I had made, made them with like dotted lines, like dot, line, dot. They kind of just describe the, uh, the dependencies be between various things, kind of almost like uh, uh, when, if you're programming, uh, you, you might like import a library and derive from that. So, so for example, calculus derives from uh, algebra and trigonometry. So there would be like two arrows going up to a calculus installation, right? And and but also conversely, the calculus might provide greater insights into say algebra. So there could be an arrow back in that sense. So the arrows describe the, the direction and, and concentration of, of one's focus, what one is thinking about. It. In the sense of the scope development, one of what what kind of ideas one spontaneously has. Now, while schooling, parenting, and all that, when we grow up, we all grow up in more or less the same way, at least in the like, sort of like the OECD side, probably almost 99% of the world now. And they all aim to develop us into so called functional, ad functional adults. Yeah, and a functional adult these days, that is someone who can sit still, shut up. Uh, talk when spoken to, face front, be nice, follow simple instructions and do what's expected. So basically um, a, a good worker. Um, and we kind of create this base. If we create such a base, we can install so-called extensions on them. So they build on this circle here, which I call the core living. And we don't really care as much about whether we're good at actually living. Like, I mean, these days, you know, you have you have teenagers growing up and having to take so-called adulting courses in how, like how to actually do adult stuff. Uh, the, the primary purpose of this sort of like educational commodification is to prepare us to put extensions on and they can go in like different directions. So these are mostly tailored towards achieving some kind of expertise. So getting into that mindset in order to get a, a good, a well-paying job, a well-paid career. So we can earn money and buy all the stuff that we kind of forgot how to how to do down here. So a lot of my previous talk is, uh, is pretty much a, a, a rant against that uh, uh, idea. And another interesting factor here is that whatever we learn here as part of our education is often not very well connected to the core down here. If you study something like uh, let's let's just say you go to medical school, uh, you you don't do that to become a more healthy individual, physically healthy or men mentally healthy. You do it in, essentially in order to get a job somewhere. And so you might actually not apply the lessons you're learning on, on yourself. Another example might be a, a chef who can cook like wonderful meals, but then go home and eat junk food because they just don't care to, you know, cook for themselves. Uh, it keeps halting me. Okay. Well, so this is what it, um, this is what the um, sort of like the image of the knowledge, the brain, probably really looks like so it's more realistic of the of the so-called adult human consumer build so i mean in software build is something that's a program that's constructed in a particular way um this is uh both good and bad in the sense that it's uh, it's natural um the human mind uh continuously adapts to its environment so uh anyone i would say over 25 have probably realized that they start forgetting things they've learned when they no longer need them at least that's kind of like what was my experience uh so so you you you're, you're quite quite unique if you still remember everything uh, you learned in high school say or even everything you learned in undergraduate or during a masters if you went that way and what's happening is that we have hazardly um accrete new error layers on top of old layers and then we forgot what we learned as, as we were doing that. And that can lead to things like the curse of knowledge, you know, where you simply do not know how to instruct people because you forgot how it was to learn things in, in the first, first place. And, and we delete arrows that doesn't really fit anywhere that we're not really using. Um, a lot of the programs we, we tend to install come with uh, sort of like defensive systems, like, a, like almost like an intellectual immune system that makes it hard to learn or see things in new ways. This, this can be a good idea because it kind of blocks uh, our susceptibilities to things like conspiracy theories and misinformation. Uh, on the flip side, it also shuts down any new idea, uh, especially if our, our, our core and our con entire construction uh, is built to support our self-identity. If, if, if we think, for, if we identify ourselves with our jobs, it's, it's very hard to question the idea of having a job and that's summarized in the, the famous Upton Sinclair quote that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Um, 
in addition, you know, you might actually go in a, in a completely wrong direction. Again, sort of path dependent, depending on what environment in you might install certain software that prevent the installation of functional layers on top of it. And unlike a, a computer, you can't just delete it or wipe, wipe the hard disk and like reinstall the operating system. You have to like go into deep debugging, which in human terms is called therapy. Um, so the overall build strategy for this is essentially that it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, there's no meta strategy for, for, uh, for learning all this. And so the, the standard human here is, is usually a professional that has compartmentalized a lot of aspects in the life. They have a job, they have a, uh, maybe they go to church or yoga or something. They have TV friends and they, they go to various favorite stores and so on. Um, so in the aggregate, what has happened is that um, the knowledge sphere, the nose sphere, uh, has essentially been fragmented. And that is shown over here. Uh, and if there's, if, if, if I were to pick a logo for the meta crisis, this one would be it. And what I've done here is essentially I've taken the individual and then I've just like rotated it around. Uh, so this is, this is sort of like a stylistic way of showing, showing what the problem is in the aggregate. Essentially human knowledge has been divided and conquered um, by, by the system that sits on top of us. Essentially the meta thinking system has done this, uh, not intentionally. Um, and, but the problem is that all our meta thinking is essentially governed by technique, uh, shaggy little style, uh, simple processes, you know, routines. We do this this way. And there are two ways, two, uh, you can see two features or three features. Uh, the first one is that there's like vertical integration within like each field of specialization. This is where we spend most of our waking hours or most of our thought hours, so to speak. And these all run by like isolated hierarchies, you know, like someone working up here is not for sure not connected very much to those who are working down here. There are rules to follow. There are certain standards. Uh, people make up measures and not try to optimize them. So these are run, run by what, what, what we could call like 20th century uh, management uh, philosophy. Uh, the strictest way of thinking about that is just like a standard production line where ideas, you know, R&D department, engineering department, components and so on, and we get a product here. Um, the other thing is that the core down here, so that's the other thing, the horizontal, the horizontal integration is very weak and it usually happens in the form of a product or something we see on TV, you know, like we, we watch news entertainment, we don't really understand what it is, but it's entertaining. Uh, most of our mo movies now follow some kind of formula that has been shown to work in the past, so we like uh, make reboots and stuff like that. Horizontal communication, so we can sort of all be on the same page is typically done via, via Insta face tweets, you know, like where the, where the format is, is quite limited, you know, they, they deliberately cut us down to like, you know, like a few hundred characters or, and then you have to click more if people have more to say, but that never happens. And everything has essentially become a product slash service solution so that if you have any problem whatsoever, you know, you, you either call someone, you know, to get some service, like the toilet doesn't flush anymore. You call a plumber and pay a few hundred bucks and you get a new toilet. You don't know how, how it works. You don't even know how to like grow your own food, for example. Um, and all this has been made sort of, as I wrote, like diluted to the lowest common denominator for maximum inclusion and engagement. So engagement being the key word for social media, but also like, the greatest extent of, of, of mass market uh, possibilities. So specialists have um, identified different symptoms of this. I mean, because this is not really a healthy way for the entire planet to know about things. Um, so we have like the meaning crisis, we have diseases of despair, political polarization, energy transition, so on and so forth. And there are more than those. So I apologize if your favorite one is not on there, but I mean that these, these things are being studied, you know, we see all the symptoms, but the, the, the actual underlying disease is, is still sort of work in progress. But for those of us who are outside a given specialization, we tend to discount them. They are essentially too far away in the, in the initial graph I, I showed, you know, the discount rate. It's too far out of scope, so we don't really care. Um, so if you recall the space-time flight, you know, we, we don't really bother with things until it either personally affects us ourselves or our friends and family or our salaries, which roughly corresponds to like Keegan levels two, three, and four, which is, uh, I think, something like 98% of humanity. Um, so how do we solve this stuff? Um, 
Well, I mean, if you ask an expert, <laughs> and that's the 20th century way of doing things, is uh, where you have one expert you that informs or provides a product for some for 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 for, for any given consumer, right? It's essentially one perspective on on one problem, and the solution. And this is once once you start think uh, uh, paying attention to this, it becomes almost tragic. Uh, the solution will always be we will be be provided in the form of whatever whatever the uh, expert and something um, wh where they're coming from. Uh, so that's 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 sort of like if, if all you have a hammer, you know, everything is a nail, right? So uh, if if the proposed solution is education, it's probably being proposed by an educator. Activists always want to either raise awareness or protest something. Uh, politicians, well, then the solution is program funding. If it's a technologist, the obvious answer is well, we've got to invent some new technology and so on and so forth. And the idea is, of course, that once this is provided, uh, then some magic will happen and the problem is solved. Uh, but of course, only the particular specialist problem is solved. And it's not really acknowledged that that might have like side effects elsewhere and cause problems elsewhere. You know, like let let's say free trade, for example, just moves the pollution elsewhere uh, and cause another specialist to have a problem. And it's essentially hot potato games. Um, so for the most part, uh, even even if we might see it, we don't act act like it uh, in the sense that there are systemic limited uh, system systems limits in in processing these silos or the petals of this kind of damaged flower. Um, so these go unseen and people are locked into this uh, this system here, right? There's not much you can do here once you're sitting up here, you know, because your communication lines are essentially broken. Um, so um, of course, people try to try to work with what they have, and then the, the immediate idea is like, well, we got to start some kind of interdisciplinary institute or group and collaborate with people from other departments. And I would say, well, I mean, it obviously works to some degree, but it obviously also does not work since we all still have all these unsolved problems. So um, weak connections will be made between different fields, uh, but most other other fields, you know, your adjacent fields from from you know your, the, the 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 expert that sits next to you, um, they only have a, a, a weak understanding. I mean, obviously more than a layman understanding, but still only a weak understanding to. to of, of other experts compared to their own level of expertise. So what you have is this is, is kind of blind man and the elephant problem where everybody sees a specific part and, and, and it's trying to collaborate to understand what the elephant actually is, but nobody sees the full elephant. And, and this, this can get pretty egregious uh, in, in some sense. Uh, for example, to an economist, the entire STEM field is, is one parameter, something called the Douglas Cobb uh, equation of function. Where, where literally one number is the dollar input and then, you know, question mark, question mark, question mark, magic happens and technology comes out to solve problems in productivity factors. Uh, and it's not like it's, it's uh, that scientists have more insights, you know, if you look at, um, so I haven't, I haven't read the, uh, the, the new uh, assessment report uh, from the IPCC yet, but the previous one from uh, 2014, had uh, essentially all political and economical responses to, to climate change reduced to five generic socioeconomic pathways giving some kind of emission scenario depending on people what people would do. But it's very hard to you know, do second order effects and this response to this which responded to that. So these are integrated assessment models and that's extremely hard. So the interdisciplinary groups, horizontal bandwidth. So again, going around here, not just around out here in the perimeter, not just in here, is again, very limited to presentations and conversations and dialogue and collaborating. And so you'll have like years of experimental knowledge reduced to brief uh, statements to, to fit on a, on a slideshow or presentation. I mean, the irony does not escape me here, but I mean, we do what we can with what, what, what with, we do what we can with what we have, right? The main problem with this is that your, your fellow experts, they can answer unknown unknowns. That's stuff that you don't know, but they might know. But only if you know the right question to ask. If you, if, only if you know, you, you need to be able to know the question, a good question. And so in order to provide good answers, almost mean that you have to say, well, this is not really what you wanted to ask me. What you really wanted to ask me was this, and then I'll answer. So there's a, there's a certain air gap between, between the two. That, that makes it really hard to come up with creative ideas other beyond you know single words to inspire sentences and so on. 
So mostly creativity happens inside a, a single head. Um, with um, with one field, uh, sorry, with with one field knowledge, you're also limited to to sort of one field creativity. Uh, whereas with if you, if you have like two two fields, you can do one perspective on on the other field and vice versa. If you have three fields, you can of course do like all three fields, but you can do the third field, you know, interacting, uh, sort of like defining the perspective you have on, on these two fields. Uh, but if you're only talking about it, that doesn't happen. So um, you need to be transdisciplinary, which means one person understanding more than one field. And, and in that way, you would actually know uh, good questions uh, to ask. And you would probably also know the answer unless you can like spin much faster. Um, and therein, I would say, lies the problem of the meta crisis. So, uh, so when I originally started uh, making this uh, presentation, I thought, uh, let's use food as a as a setup for this uh, metaphorical setup. So I think I think the problem we had with our thinking is very much like the problem we have with our food, and it's not. It's not just a standard American diet. It's it's uh, this is pretty much spread all over the all over the Western world, possibly the entire world. And um, so the problem is that that food as a food and as well as as, as as thoughts and solutions have become cheap, abundant, they're convenient, they're very product oriented in the sense they come in, in plastic wrap and, and colorful boxes. Uh, they're likable and shareable. We take pictures of our food and then post it online and so on. Requires zero skill whatsoever to eat it, right? Um, they're, they're, they're convenient in a sense that uh, maybe they don't really require refrigeration or storage in any way. And we can just reheat them, you know, like when people bake with cake mixes, stuff like that. Um, they're mom momentarily satisfying. They're loaded with salt, sugars, and fats, things that are bad for us in excess quantities. And what's most interesting to me was that um, after going going through sort of some packages is that most of them are only made with about 10 different uh, ingredients. Uh, and these are called ultra ingredients, as in like ultra processed ingredients. And an ultra processed ingredient is something you cannot buy in a supermarket. So this would be something like soy protein or a fat molecule of like a particular length. Uh, so they're, and these are all combined in, in very creative ways with food coloring, you know, like red 40, yellow five and so on, or preservatives or, or taste and so on uh, to create what looks like a lot of different food, but really is you're just eating these uh, 10 different ultra ingredients. And if you're eating the standard, if you're eating like the average person, that is 60% of your food. And so it's no wonder that we have all these lifestyle diseases. And I think in the same sense with our thoughts and solutions, again, we come from almost the same educational system. It's done in the same way. We use more or less the same textbooks. And so we have the, 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 the same idea. So even if we think we are like diversifying our creativity, we're really not because we are well building out of the same idea. So we have lifestyle diseases and we have no sphere diseases, which is essentially the meta crisis. So um, why do we do that? Um, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a case of having a, a, a good thing turning into too much of a good thing. So, I mean, we don't need to go back more than um, about like a hundred years or something um, where cheap mass production, which came about in the start of the 1900s, uh, it's pretty much solved the problem of like running water, sewage problems, or having to spend almost all your budget on food and you risk starving once a decade. And you had a fairly lot, short um, life expectancy, of course, drawn down by a lot of childhood birth. So um, uh, childhood death. Um, so early success with that, I mean, this, this was absolutely fantastic. I mean, the difference between, you know, like 1860 and 1920 is enormous compared to say the difference between 19, uh, 1960 and 2020, right? Uh, you can, I mean, from, from 1860 to 1920 would be mind blowing. From 1960 to 2020 would not. You would have a few technological gadgets, you know, like the internet and smartphones and microwave ovens that you didn't see, but you would have most of the things. Um, so this installed this kind of worldwide meme that this was pretty much the only way to go because it was so success successful. And even in like the economics profession, they like pretty much strongly couple increasing consumption to increased happiness. 
even though like behavioral stuff, psychological research are beginning to show, you know, that they're more of a good thing uh, of pushing in the same direction is not necessarily better. I mean, the Easterlin paradox pretty much shows that happiness stops increasing once you have a certain base, le uh, base level of uh, consumption, like when your basic needs are met. What mostly matters to you is actually not how much you have, but that the fact that you have a little bit more than your neighbor. So it's, it's sort of like a pecking order thing. Um, but if everybody plays that game, you know, you can create tons of waste and garbage and so on and so forth. And the cultural inertia of, of this has called, uh, is, is what caused the predicament, you know, resource overshot and so on, and people getting left behind, especially as like a professional leverage comes in, you know, one good programmer can maybe be a hundred times as productive as a bad programmer. But one good person with the shovel digging holes is maybe only twice as good. Twice as good. So there's, there's a lot more like the Gini index is, is increasing substantially because we're still pursuing this mass industrialization into the same ideas using technology, technological leverage. Uh, and as described sort of like on the previous slide, we're all kind of oblivious, oblivious to this because we don't see it uh, and it doesn't really affect us personally. But in, in 2020, uh, with the COVID lockdowns, uh, where we were all kind of forced to stay at home and, and be told whether whether we were essential or inessential workers, uh, there's some cracks started like happening in the foundation and, uh, of this and quite a few started rethinking their lives, whether it's really worth it, you know, is their career meaningful if, if it's suddenly being described as inessential or is more money useful if you can't, if you're not allowed to go to, to Walmart and buy a solution so you can't call the plumber because, you know, it's, uh, they're not allowed to, to, to come in due to the lockdowns, you know, the risk of actually dying of, 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 of a pandemic, right? Um, so, okay. So what, what I'm saying is we probably need a different philosophy here. Uh, and a good philosophy is like a good diet. And a good diet, uh, just to torture the metaphor, requires good ingredients, good recipes, good balance, as in like not eating the same 10 ingredients all the time and respect. And by respect, I don't know what the, uh, there should be a better word for this, but essentially it means respecting both the person who's eating and the, where the ingredients are coming from. So some, some kind of overall concern for the greater sphere. So what I'm saying is that we need some kind of post-consumerist, the post-specialist philosophy, which then requires new ingredients, new recipes and so on and so forth. So maybe that sounds cool. So the question is, how do I do that? Um, so the original, I mean, originally they had kind of like the right idea. Uh, when they first started building uh, colleges, the, um, the higher education aim was to develop the generalist course, essentially expanding it beyond high school, you know, making it bigger and rounder. Um, uh, but the problem is, of course, uh, today is that the infosphere is so enormous that we cannot do that. Uh, there's so much uh, information generated that we cannot attain knowledge about all of that. So what was done sort of in the primitive sense back then was to uh, do some machine thinking, you know, like we just got to make standardized parts and then fit them together later with some simpler system. This is standard engineering and it is essentially what has constructed, constructed the meta system that we are currently in. So we have specialist trade schools with the extensions. Um, um, it's impossible to do sort of like the frankly ideal of generalized uh, integrated thinking because of, of the sheer volume of it, but we can approximate it with the transdisciplinary knowledge by doing essentially deep knowledge. So not just reading a, a fun book or watching a TED talk, but really working for a few hundred hours in, in, in different fields, maybe thousands of hours. Uh, and these fields has to have to be different, I mean, really different. It's not just a question if you're say like a software program of picking up, you know, like a design class or something or another language. It really has to have different cultures, different systems and modes of thinking. So um, I, these, are, these are essentially what, what I've spent more than I would say 300 hours, some, somewhere between 300 and 10,000 hours on, on each of these. Uh, so that's physics, finance, anti-consumerism, sword fighting. Okay, you're not uh, energy resources as in like limits to energy limits to growth stuff uh, climate change uh, moderating culture wars and, and making clocks uh, I, I, oh, sincerely making clocks um, so and, and these if you have if you have different fields then you are able to start connecting them widely instead of just growing this like sister bubble outwards you can actually connect it to different fields it's also important to connect them more to the core 
and to alleviate this problem of having hollowed out the adulting core down here. So essentially in, in the language of before, we need to make more meaning making errors and we need to become jack of more trades and mastering some of them, but really put in some serious efforts here. And once we can do that, we it becomes possible to do like divergent thinking, thinking outside the box, literally living outside the box. And we can synthesize things, not just so like um, calculate things. Uh, we can start seeing patterns from one field existing. We can recognize them in other in other systems. And so let's bring bring ideas over. And this allows, I would say, true creativity, which is asking the right questions. So. Um, So what we need is essentially more ingredients, individual solvers, and this kind of very corny transdisciplinary inventors of the gap of the uh, of, 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 of the, of the gaps in, in, in the infosphere. Um, because the problem is that the current specialization, specialization based infosphere is highly inefficient uh, because it all needs to communicate via products and services down at the core. And it's very hard to communicate around the perimeter outside between experts from expert to expert. It all has to circle circle back around before people actually can see it and agree on it. Um, the other problem with the current way of doing things uh, is that if something cannot be monetized, if there's no money involved in it, uh, it cannot be turned into a product or get like, a, you can't get a grant or anything for it. it, it peters out or it doesn't exist at all. So what I'm calling for is essentially that individuals need to start going in uh, more in this way, you know, shut down the TV and start learning stuff and start connecting things and start thinking in these ways instead. And so we need as many people of, of this kind as we possibly can, even, even, even I mean, it's personally interesting to do. And uh, the, the chance of you coming up with something like interesting, like a, an interesting solution to some of this, some of these problems becomes much higher um and i think that i think i mean you're essentially doing a kind of like a monte carlo uh, search in, in that sense because you can't you can't just tell people that well you should study these three random things and you should study these ones and then we'll see that's not going to happen because temperament and intelligence are also factor here so you got to sort of kind of figure out how to do this uh, on your own um but as a way of illustrating how powerful this can actually be um can, I mean, uh, this is normally in, in, in say, cooking, um, inspiration is, is typically, let's say we take like an American chef and then he or she travels to France and then brings studies in France for a few years and brings back some French cooking uh, or vice versa. This is how it normally goes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm originally Danish. And so I can say this uh, uh, without sort of, <laughs> so traditional Danish, Cuisine, if that is even a thing, food cooking generally sucks. I mean, it's 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 food boiled to to come until it lacks any kind of taste whatsoever. It's like pickled fish and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a there's a reason why you never ever see Danish restaurants out in the world. There's no such thing. Let's go to the Danish restaurant. It's not a thing. Um, actually, but with very few exceptions. But then there's this, like this famous uh, restaurant called uh, Noma, which stands for Nordisk Melt or Nordic food. And what they did was actually totally out of the box in that sense, in that they went into nature, so it's local Nordic, uh, and they picked everything. And they tried to prepare it in all kinds of way, you know, let's pickle this and burn it and stew it and so on, and then see what tastes well. And then they found some very interesting combinations. So just by doing this brute force, they completely reinvented um, the, 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 the cooking field. Um, and so that's pretty much what they're famous for. But of course, I mean, that's, that's kind of limited, but you can brute force that. You can't do that with humans. But just to give an example of, of how it can happen sort of randomly. Uh, so this is my own contribution to the, to the FIRE movement. Um, so FIRE stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. These ideas that go back to at least Thoreau or Emerson or the start of industrialization. So people have really sort of resisted this whole like earn by thinking for for like almost 200 years, like 150 years. And so my contribution was to essentially nail the, the, the retirement math and change the paradigm here. So um, the previous expert or popular cons uh, consensus there was, um, hang on. Um, that, that everybody should, uh, sorry, but I got lost in my notes here. 
Uh, yeah, so the, the, the previous consensus was that everybody should save about the responsible thing to do was to save um, five to 20% of, of your paycheck. Or whenever you got to $1 million, because it's a round number, you know, people in other countries would probably not pick that, but it's always $1 million. Or spending was covered by some kind of risk adjusted returns. You know, you wanted to retire, you had 400K, you spent, you know, 40K a year. And then you go to your investment advisor saying, this is what I have, this is what I need. And, so, and then the advisor would make like, well, we got to do some risky, risky investment at 10% per year because that's what we need. That is the way it was done until at least the 2000s. Um, so what I did was to take essentially three fairly unrelated fields and combine them and, and find a solu another solution to this. Um, so in physics, the there's a tradition for looking essentially at the entire parameter space whenever you do this. You know, you're gonna you want to see what everything you want to see what the universe looks like. So instead of going from like uh, five to twenty percent, which is what you would typically find in a in a in a banker's spreadsheet, I, I went from zero to one hundred percent. Why has this not been done done before? Because most physicists are kind of aloof in terms of of this whole money thing. And the idea, if you work in, in research, is that as long as they pay you enough to be reasonably comfortable, it, you're, you're you're happy because you're you're spending you know like 80 100 hours uh, at, at the research bench anyway, right? So you just need you know just need some salary to pay cafeteria food essentially. Um, from the financial perspective, though, they they have all the math already, but uh, the, the the paradigm there is that you always wanted to maximize for consumption, uh, lifetime consumption, and so the only question the only question is essentially how can you consume as much as possible, and the way to do that is of course to work for like 30, 40 years, uh, and then that naturally limits you to a zero to thirty percent range of, of savings. Uh, but I also had a experience with anti-consumerism because when I was in grad school, I started this whole personal project of trying to figure out whether it was possible to live an interesting life, spending no more than $6,000 per year. And I got that number by essentially looking at what level of spending was sustainable if the entire planet did it, right? So if all, back then it was about six and a half billion people, I think. Um, so I put a $6,000 limits on me and that naturally gave me like a 75% plus savings rate on my grad student, grad student um, salary. So that went into the bank. So I had these three components and then I combined them, did the math and essentially twisted the paradigm around to instead of looking at a billion dollars or specific uh, saving or specific risk adjusted returns, it became all about the savings rate. So you can tell, if you tell me I'm saving 50%, I'll tell you, well, you'll be financially independent in seven, 17 years now. If you're saving 80% something, well, you'll, you have it in five years. Uh, or if you are 5%, well, I forget what it is, but it's probably 60 years or something like that. So there was, there was like a shift in perspective from that. I think we're gonna run over time here. Um, so the question is, how do you go from individual change to, to aggregate movements or, or, or like that? So it's, it's all fine if you've got to sit and build in individual resilience and all, but you want to, if you want to change the world, you need a little bit more. So individual voluntary change uh, requires A, a vision, B, a plan, and C, some discomfort with the present situation that you're in. I mean, if, if you like any of these three, you're not going to get anywhere. I mean, you might have a great vision of how wonderful things could be and you might hate where you currently are, but if you don't have a plan, you're not going anywhere. Um, conversely, uh, for, for movement, you need some kind of aligned directional motion. So the one way I would think metaphorically about this is like um, a gas. So uh, from a physics perspective, a gas is com com uh, made out of, of uh, molecules that move around at a certain distribution, Boltzmann distribution, and an individual air molecule might move at like 600 meters per second, even if the wind, if there's no like apparent motion in, in, in the air. But if you add like one meter per second in one direction to, to all these on top of the 600, you know, then you begin to start feeling a little bit of a wind and you have, you have movements. Uh, the problem is that, that, um, that people are, are different. So if you, if you tell people, just tell people something, they might not, necessarily move in the same direction. In particular, if you tell people about some kind of particular pro problem, you know, you try to protest that or raise awareness about a certain problem, most people don't really care because it doesn't really, because A, you know, it requires a specialist to see, see the problem or it doesn't affect them personally. 
And some might even be asinine enough to do the exact opposite thing of what you're, of, of what you're trying to do, you know. Um, so in my opinion, that's not a very effective way. It's not a very sneaky way anyway, as it's too direct. Um, so the second second proposal is, of course, the standard one. Well, we got to ele elevate humanity somehow, you know, like to to keep in five or uh, integral consciousness or uh, uh, increase uh, sort of like from egocentric to world centric or, or orientation. And, and once people are sort of at the higher level of, of, of insight, they'll surely do the right thing. Right. And, and they probably will. But the problem is that it's simply too difficult to actually do this in a, in a general sense. And um, in, in, as I mentioned before, like with the in over our heads, uh, we might simply not live long enough for this to become a, a, a real factor, as in uh, you might need to live to like 110 years to, for, for a substantial amount to, to get to a world-centric orientation. So the, my proposal is essentially that um, we design a plan where all the what impacts are aligned. So in the sense of like the air molecules that they all move in the same direction, that's the thing to focus on. And then it doesn't matter if we give people different reasons or people have different reasons for going in that direction. As long as it's going in the right direction, it doesn't matter you know, how it's done even or why it's done. The line plan, like uh, over here, it has to make a material difference, as in like, it can't not just be some kind of good idea you hear about. It. You actually have to want to do it when, when you hear about it. Um, the set of whys is also important, and it's important that it's part of, a, part of the design and not an afterthought. I mean, there's like a lot of, especially with technology, there's a lot of technology that's essentially a solution in search of a problem. And, and you especially see this in like the, the the software world, like here's this new program, it'll allow you to do all this stuff. But people say, well, I'm not gonna, I don't really need this. I'm already fine with what I have. Um, but importantly, you need you need to consider different target groups and the more target groups you have, the better. And this becomes sort of like the carrot vector for you. So you have different visions and different reasons for just different descriptions of, of the discomfort and even different plans. So these plans have to be, when you, when you write such a plan or when you figure such a plan out what people can and should do, it has to be written with uh, emergent movements of popular adoption in mind. So, ooh. all right. So in order for that to work well, one has to have some uh, ethical standards uh, for, for, for the design practice. In particular, the plan has to work for a specific individual within the current system. It has to work in a sense e that you, the individual gets something out of it, even if others do not come along. So for the fire movement, everybody is free to save and invest And if, but if nobody else kind of does that, uh, you, you, you still, you're still well off actually. You have, you have savings now, you have, you have some, some kind of financial uh, ability. Um, Plan also has to work for all individuals if everybody does it. And that's sort of like the honest society rule. And uh, that pretty much prevents you from creating pyramid schemes uh, where only like the initial adopters benefit from all the other ones. There needs to be a continuous transition between the here as in where we are now and where we wanna go. Uh, so basically the plan is not allowed to stop working once we transition to some specific point. It has to you know, go like that, it can't go like this. And most importantly, and this is probably the most, this is the hardest thing to do about all of this, is that it has to respect human, that's the respect word again. So it has to respect human limits and maintain solution integrity, even when it's misinterpreted. So it has to have a failure mode and a graceful exit stage for people who do not want to go all the way. And you can, you pretty much, if you come up with something complex and clever in scope that will solve everything, you can, you can, you can, you know, it, it's assured that people will misinterpret it and try to fit it in, in, into their own situation. So a, a cooking example again is that let's suppose you have, have, have one ingredient that's poisonous, right? And another ingredient that, that's the antidote to the poison that cancels this out. And combining those, you create some kind of superfoods. And now you're thinking, wow, great, I invented the superfood. Everybody must eat this and you know, become super healthy. But when you implement that in practice, you that, that, you, you, I'll guarantee you there are some people who say, well, this ingredient sounds good, but this one I don't really like. So I'm just going to cook with this one. And then they end up poisoning themselves. Uh, I mean, uh, current, current, you know, like pandemic <laughs> examples are like rampant for this. Um, so um, it has to have failure modes, essentially, even if it's misinterpreted. Uh, so here are some examples of emergent movements. Um, 
I don't really like sort of like how I check put check boxes in there and question marks because it's it's for sure um, kind of like a grayscale thing you know it's not like it's either on or off you know you either get a check mark or you don't so it's probably better to to grade it you know like this gets an A and this gets a D or this gets an F or something um, I think the main point of this is the more check marks you have you know the longer lived the more robust your your movement is essentially so the ones you know that's been here for a long time and will probably be here for a long time something like the fire movement permaculture uh stoicism uh and probably others whereas something like a specific pro protest might not actually work uh in the long run it's not like you have protests that are going on say in for, for 50 years at a time but the other ones do and i i i think i think it's because of, of getting getting these marks you actually have a solid movement when you have the more marks you have the better um so um i'll be done in five minutes by the way <laughs> um so the question is how to plan a plan for driving emergent uh, movements because uh usually these things are made like half ass half and without a meta strategy and retrospect by throwing mud on the wall uh, in order to do that uh, there are like three different uh we you can split it in three different ways using the, pro uh, the process management triangle so you've probably all seen that where where uh, management, the sales go into engineering and say, well, we want this product. And then the engineer says, well, you can have, you ha have a product that's either good, easy, or quick, pick any two, right? And so you can get these three, it can either be quick and easy, it can be uh, good and easy, or it can be uh, quick and good. And you can, of course, split it in other ways uh, to uh, like, you know, left, right politics, value memes, like spiral dynamics, or if you're making a health program, you could focus on either fitness, vanity, or health, you know, how you look, how you feel, uh, what you can do, or you can even do it by Keegan levels, or you can combine these ones with these three plans, because people, this is all about scope development, essentially, and people have different preferences for how much time they want to dedicate to this stuff. Um, so, so you can't, you can't just say like everybody should do like the uh, good and quick one, because that one's pretty hard. Can also not say that uh, everybody should do the quick and easy because that usually leads to bad solutions. Uh, and this one is correspondingly then a slow solution. Um, so how does this actually work once we uh, once we sort of have, have the whole carrot vector and the what to do planning set up like that? Um, so let's figure out here needs some work. It's like super complicated. Um, so I might I might I might mess that up. But um, the first thing to think about is like the uh, hopefully well-known overturn window where everything opinions of other people's political opinions is all relative right so you can probably consider yourself your own your own values quite reasonable and if you go sort of like a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right they're kind of acceptable but if you go too far out they become like radical and if you go even further out they, they're pretty much unthinkable but all this according to overturn is, is relative right so, so if you think what, what you think is normal, if, if you know, if, if you consider yourself reasonable and think this is a radical, then the radical will also think you're radical. So this is symmetric and relative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, society is, of itself has a, uh, an average over time window. Um, when we go to something like scope development, uh, we get to the Wheaton scale, which uh, I think was invented. I mean, it's named after Paul, uh, Paul Wheaton, who did it for permaculture. And then we are going to the solid line here. And so that's sort of like a few rules for that one. So the first one is that it follows a, uh, a power law, a power scale. So you have uh, essentially X percent less at each level out. So if you have like, uh, say, 10 times less at the next level, and if you have like 1,000 people here, you have 100 here, 10 here, and one here, and so on. So if you start like with, with 8 billion people out here, you might have you know like a few up here. Um, but like the overturn window, the judgment is completely subjective and relative to, to where you are yourself. So if you're like, say here, right, um, then you're not seeing it like, like this, you'll consider yourself normal. You know, you, 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 you've chosen sort of like a very reasonable approach a normal this is what everybody should do. Um, but you can see those who are a little bit ahead of you, they would look inspiring to you, you can kind of see where they're going, but you're not kind of there yet. Whereas those who are further ahead, well, those guys like, either extreme or even downright insane, you know, like you have no, they should probably be committed or something. Whereas those who are a little bit behind you, well, they have potential if only they would like try a little harder. 
Uh, whereas if you go too far behind you, well, those are the assholes who are destroying the world, right? And it, it's no matter where you are, you will always sort of have this kind of asymmetric over overturn win, window uh, opinion of others. And that's, that's not a good thing actually, but it is what it is. Um, what this does, the, the x-axis uh, down here is that it creates a static, steady mimetic drift because no matter where you are, if you're here, then these guys will be inspiring. If you're here, these guys will be inspiring. If you're here, these guys and so on and so forth. So th this curve is always moving in, 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 in this direction, right? But what we wanna do if we're gonna like fix the world, so to speak, is to make it go faster. And so what we need, we essentially need to turn a slow wind into a breeze. So we need a trailblazer. And the trailblazer is someone, someone who pops up out here and, and makes noise. And that creates a mimetic shift. So this one is a little exaggerated. Normally it's, it's much smaller than this. So if their plan is actionable and it can be translated to other people and it can fail well, you know, so that people don't have to like accept all the craziness because I mean, recall for, for most people, if you pop out, uh, up out here, you'll be seen as extreme or even insane, but not to everybody, right? So different popularizers, people who, who, who are willing to go some of the way, they'll fill in behind you. And so if you have this here, people will fill in here, right? There'll be other people here. And other people here will see these people and so on and so forth. So this moves, moves this curve out here. It's kind of hard to do with, without my hands here. And this, this is what creates the emergent movement. So if we go back to the, the three scope shape before uh, these guys here, it, it's usually such that the, the, the good and the quick preference, that is the geeks, the trailblazers, the athletes, uh, people who do moonshots, literally maybe, these will be the, the crazy ones out here. They're, they're the ones trying things that, that nobody else is trying simply because they think it's cool, you know, like they're creating this kind of uh, transdisciplinary solution and then they want to share it with everybody. They become followed by the good and easy after maybe even multiple years, five years, 10 years. And these are the popularizers, the professionals. I mean, for example, uh, 10 years ago, if you went into a bank and said, well, I, I'm saving 75% of my salary so I can retire by the time I'm 35, for example, they would, they would think you would be crazy. But if you do it today though, then in many cases, they'll actually know what you're talking about. And so, okay, I can actually make, you, make, make a plan for you here. So, so that has changed, right? And then once, this sort of becomes acceptable reasonably for, 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 for the experts, then it gets into the mainstream and, and you start seeing, you know, like simple guides and like one day experiences and seminars and so on and so forth. Um, naively, um, like in Spiral Dynamics, these would be kind of like a tier one thingies, tier one people. And so you could make like a, a, a three by three matrix that showed exactly what they thought about each other. Of, and this would typically be something like described down here, like, the the the, good, the 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 hard mode here will think the the, the easy mode as uh, irresponsible slackers or something like that, and vice versa. But but that's a really bad bad way of doing it. I mean, it's very easy to to sort of like start start installing purity tests and so on. It's like you're not really doing it the right way, and then start you know like um, hammering on other people. But the thing is that everybody in this one or whatever kind of plan scheme you set up, they're needed to drive this continuity because. If it's just you out here and nobody behind you, you know, if you don't have professionals and mainstream people to back you up, you know, nothing is going to happen, right? So, 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 the, the thing is to actually actively support the whole, whole stream here, the whole shift. These, these sort of like, what we could call mini shifts. You need, you need, you essentially need to come in and support these guys, uh, and not tear them down because they're not if, if they're failing too much in your like perfect opinion or something. So my conclusion, and only ten minutes late, sorry, um, is that Plato's cave is essentially in a in a, in a pickle with the meta crisis. So we have you know the blind men or the specialists they've identified many perspectives or symptoms of of of, of the elephant, uh, and there's some emergent realization uh, just by naming things with meta crisis is that there's some kind of common object, a problem behind it. So that would be like the, the, the fire in Plato's cave, a structural cri crisis, the way the thinking is wired or in software terms, um, the operating system is, 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 is broken because some update failed somewhere. And there are two solutions to that. We can fix the cave 
oh, we can try to move out of the cave. And we've been trying to fix the cave for like decades and it's not really working very well. So I'm proposing that we try to move out into the gaps, which is up here with supposedly nice. Uh, by the way, this painting was painted by my wife. So it's actually hanging over there. Um, moving out um, requires many, many roles to play. And, and again, we need to sort of like support each other doing this. And we, we need a motivational carrot, carrot vector uh, for the prisoners. Prisoners could be everybody pretty much down here. Uh, we need people to explore how to get out of the fire. Uh, we need new values and we need a new way of like wiring our thinking. And in particular, we need new how, what's and why is a new way of forming meeting. Otherwise, like in the, you know, like the Matrix movie, people take the, people get frustrated living in an underground submarine or whatever it was, and they want to go back in, 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 in the program because that's just nicer. Um, as, as, as the uh, sort of like the movement matures, there will be like differentiation or speciation. Uh, there needs to be way stations, you know, so that these people up here are not lost and not knowing what to do or how to get up. Uh, we need maps of this. Essentially, the whole, whole shebang here. And yeah, we need, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of it. Uh, many, many roles to play, but uh, at least I think I provided some kind of structure for how to, to, to think about it so it doesn't. Uh, become this kind of throwing mud, uh, mud on the wall kind of process. So that's, that's a deliberate way of trying to accomplish this. So that's it. Awesome. Um, so well done, uh, Jacob. Let's give a silent round of applause to uh, Jacob's awesome presentation today. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, I have a hard stop at the bottom of the hour. So perhaps we can um, squeeze in one or two questions, but it might be good to also have a, a follow up session just for questions and conversation around this. So we might uh, uh, announce that later. But uh, um, so many good questions. Uh, we'll call on Kevin first. Uh, Kevin, if you can ask one of your questions. Hi. Um, hey, Jacob. Great presentation. Uh, I'll try and see if I can combine my two questions. So in creating interdisciplinary thinkers, I'm wondering if in your experience, you found any fields that sort of act as like force multipliers to help you understand uh, more fields. Like for example, right. I thought maybe cognitive science, like learning science, philosophy, possibly like anthropology, right. et cetera. Yeah, I think in that sense, I probably got lucky in picking theoretical physics because that creates, um, sort of like the proper arrogance to think everything as a simple model you can just draw on the back of the envelope. I mean, there's a certain style to my presentations and they're all rooted in, in, in that education. And of course you get, you get the math and the science and so on and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I, don't, I don't think that just, just understanding physics will give you the whole range. It will not give you a good understanding of poetry, for example, uh, or politics for that matter. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure I could say that you should just go study this thing and it'll unlock everything else. I mean, it's probably more a question of saying what you should not do, that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't really have like a good answer for you there. That's, that's why I was kind of implying that people should pursue what they what they felt most like doing, but doing it at a some, some, somewhat disciplined sense in that it's not all building in the same direction. You know, that kind of weird figure I had that looked like a crane, you know, like the jack of all trades, uh, kind of instead of having a circle with a spike on it uh, and, and thinking that you should build like a second second spike like that. Uh, uh, you remember? I'm trying to, yeah, like this, like, yeah. So, so this, this is your standard thing, right? Right, <laughs> and don't do this. Right? You, you need to some, somehow, you know, like go in a different direction. So trying to do all the quadrants. Um, so like, like I was explaining with the, and, 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 and it's, it's often hard to see exactly um, what a big, what, how, how big of a difference things can make. For example, when I started uh, woodworking, I decided I would do everything with hand tools. And initially I was, getting um, plans, you know, constructions plans that are mainly designed for like machine thinking or power tools, table saws and so on and so forth. And so I would start with my hand plane and like make everything, all the pieces like you do if you're like a machine thinker. And then I would try to fit them together and that stuff would never fit together. And it took me 
but I, mean, I, was, I mean, I was working slow and I was also doing other things, but it was not until after like a couple of years when I realized that if, if you're doing things the Neanderthal way, you're essentially building a table, say, piece by piece. You first you build one leg and then you fit it over and then you build a second leg. And so every time you correct, if you make a mistake, which you will do with hand tools, then you correct it uh, on the next step. And so the, the, the mistakes are all sort of like auto-correcting at the same time. Whereas if, if you use a combination of hand tooling and machine thinking and build all of them at the same time, then all your mistakes add up. So if say you're building a window frame, right? That has uh, three, th four corners, right? And those corners should all be 45 degrees, right? Yeah. So if you build the first one, it's 46 degrees, then you have to make the next one 44 degrees, right? And so on and so forth all the way around. Whereas if you cut all the, all the miters first, maybe this gets too nerdy, but if all your miters are say like 44 degrees, right? Then at one corner, you will end up with a four degree, four degree gap, which is highly visible. So getting out of from one mindset and into the other mindset is absolutely non-trivial. And that's why I'm saying that one has to spend hundreds of hours within the, in a given field to actually appreciate that. Um, the, my original, one of my original ideas for making this presentation when Peter asked me whether I wanted to come back was to actually describe those different things I've done. Uh, if you actually want to see what I've done over the past uh, 10 years since I quit my career, uh, you can uh, Google something like my name and get rich slowly and the 10 year Pro progress report or something like that. This should probably come up, but I've done a lot of different things there. Um, and um, the, the thing is you can't, you can't just like read a book about it. You really have to dive down and do it. Um, I would also say um, there's this concept of like the lattice work uh, in investment, Charlie Munger, who thinks that we have, that, that humanity has something like a hundred good models or ideas for understanding the world. And, and once you know that, and I think I will confirm that, once you know most of them, uh, it is much easier to get into a new field. And generalized systems thinking is something that's like super wide and can be applied everywhere. Uh, there's also, also some like the big book of thinking, stuff like that, you know, that tries to give, give brief ideas like that. But again, if you just read the book, it's not gonna, gonna, gonna work. You actually have to apply them and, and, and get like exper experiential knowledge about it. Yeah. yeah. Does, that, does that help? Well, it probably doesn't help, but this is probably more expensive. Yeah, no, I mean, well, I think, I think your, the first things you said sort of touched on a thought I had after I asked the question where I was like, well, if you, if anyone thinks that their field is sort of the best, like cognitive yeah. like if i think that cognitive science you know helps everyone you know helps you understand the way people think better then you're just going to view the world like a cognitive scientist and you said i am a theoretical physicist now i sort of view everything with diagrams so i'm wondering right, right, right yeah, yeah exactly to, to well, try I mean, and come up with a yeah yeah i mean one of the things i, I did during my 10 years was to do some uh, computational work for one of my friends in high school who's now working on cancer research and my chemistry knowledge is pretty much like uh, two years of high school and then I just forgot about it. So no, nothing detailed. I can barely like, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't even know what it's called, like set up a set up a reaction anymore. Um, so I, I, I did like a, a, such a Skype session with, uh, with, with the collaboration over there because I'm, I, I, I did a lot of work on numerical simulation, reaction simulations on, in astrophysics uh, during my sort of like a, physics years um and they were trying to do the same thing but with like molecules and what have you and they had one language i had another language and so there was initially a lot of miscommunication but ultimately we were trying to do the same thing right we we're trying to do a reaction so once it was translated it was very very easy to understand what they were actually doing uh, and so I made a heck of a little program for them, which, I mean, apparently it, it was so that whatever I was doing with my sort of reaction simulations of hundreds and hundreds of isotopes uh, was, was several decades ahead of what they're doing in molecular uh, biology. So they apparently buy some complete, you know, packages to simulate it for them. But I gave them sort of like the innards of the whole construction. And then <laughs> when I asked my friends, like, well, the other guy, he had tears in his eyes. <laughs> so that was kind of like a cool thing, right? Um, so actually I had a bonus slide like last time that might explain this if, uh, if I can share the screen again. So uh, I'm going to 
gonna try here. We like okay. So I, th I think part of part of the problem here might be, and I, I don't know because I'm not really a language person here, but I do speak a couple of languages. Um, in that, uh, and English is not my uh, my uh, native language. Um, so in English, for 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 for, for, for things, we, we don't have this kind of like thing we knowing knowing things. But if you go to German or Danish, you have two different kinds of knowing. Um, and the one, um, so there's 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 kennen, and I think this is also found in like Scottish dialect. I'm, I don't know if anyone can confirm that, but but kennen or kinne. Uh, to to ken someone is to know it intimately or familiarly. So like, it's like lots of um, lots of items. Like you you ken something like the inside of your pocket or the back of your hand. That's something you ken. That's not something you know. Um, Kenen uh, implies some kind of um, embodied knowledge. Uh, so noctir de kenis uh, means something like you. Uh, it's close enough that you 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 feel like I, I hit this hard enough that it it kinnis so you, so you feel it you don't you don't just observe the hit you actually feel it uh, whereas wissen which you'll find in German in Wissenschaft or Danish in Wissenschaft um, that's um, like information craft and the inability is uh, an information craft essentially curating data for like the research libraries right. Um, and that's that's very different than knowing something intimately. And what I'm saying is that we essentially need to to ken more, and because this whole structure we've set up of research and development and all that is all about building the best libraries in the world. It's not about building the best people in the world. Uh, all and and I mean when I when I retired, you know, that's from, from in, in in academia. That's all always this kind of. Um, idea that that, that that it's up, up or out, right? And, and those who left, it's because they, they couldn't quite hack it. They couldn't um, couldn't make it. And, 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 and this, this one is like supremely ingrained in, in the whole culture. Uh, but what I found is that uh, I, was, I was absolutely expendable. I mean, it took a few years where I got like requests for papers, but otherwise they'll find another one, right? Because it's all about uh, building the, the vision. It's not about Having having sort of research scientists who can who actually know intimately their field and how it connects to other people, and the problem I'm saying with the meta crisis is that we we can our own little work or our job, and then we can our consumer practice, but we do not can the rest of the world. Even though we have all this information, we can Google everything, but that does not mean we know anything, right? So I don't know. The, hopefully that added a little bit in terms of what to. To go for you want to go for these guys um so uh i can stay uh about 10 minutes after the the bottom of the hour actually so let's sneak in at least one more question um and i think evan's question would be a good one or ethan i should say ethan's question if you can unmute yourself ethan uh Was it a while back? I can't remember what I asked. Um, you asked, uh, oh, Evan Brook. Sorry, not uh, Ethan. <laughs> so was, <laughs> was is there Evan uh, and Evan Brook still here? Yeah, hi there. Hey. So my question was about urgency and the urgency associated with some of the issues in the meta crisis. Specifically, my question was about climate change where there's certain tipping points where this particular decade, at least, um, is going to be the tipping point for 2C, and uh, or at least ne next decade. It, and that puts some, the fundamental constraint that I want to ask about is the constraint of urgency and what solutions are uh, not excluded by urgency, because I think that you mentioned something important. Sorry, I was running up a hill. <laughs> um, and that urgency excludes solutions like educating the youth uh, right. or over time building a mass sustained movement. And so I was curious about what your thoughts about uh, more urgent solutions might be. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So like, the, 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 I mean, so so the, the problems I mentioned with the meta crisis, you know, the examples, those are the so-called like wicked problems as, as a class. And once you add urgency, you get like the so-called super, super wicked problem, which also have a time limit. 
and and I think the question is exactly what what one's expectations are towards uh, an actual solution. So I think it's uh, it, it's it's too late to 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 actually have a have the optimal solution for say climate change that should have started forty years ago. So so now we're we're more looking at a kind of triage and trying essentially to build lifeboats. Uh, so I don't really have a uh, constraint much more as much as 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 like a reduction in opportunities. Uh, that are, are continuously narrowing down. And, and as they narrow down, we simply need to dial up both adaptability and flexibility in, in those who are interested in doing such a thing. I don't think the, 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 the superstructure of the, uh, the, um, the original, sort of like the meta thinking, the, the flower petal thing, I don't think that can be saved anymore. That, that was probably depressing, but uh, so so in in terms in, in Plato's cave terms, I think I think I think the cave is kind of gone as such, and so we need to get as many people out of it as possible, because we don't really know what's coming as such. So it's it's, it's better to to have as much optionality as possible. No, I I I, I only quick follow up would be to yeah. completely agree, particularly on that issue, is that there's no. There isn't a good chance of stopping serious suffering because of issues like climate change, yeah. and so if if it's not so much about uh, uh, quote unquote halting climate change or mm -hmm. fixing in instantly any of these problems, yeah. um, what does it mean then to live in a world where the suffering is isolated to uh, poorest and most vulnerable communities, and that suffering won't affect largely the people that have the capacity to solve it? Uh, where, how do these solutions actually end up manifesting if the pressure to solve them uh, never comes? That's a good That's question. That's the only follow-up. Thank yeah, you. I, I, I don't know, actually. I mean, it, it really depends on how big the movement gets, so to speak. Uh, if, if it remains isolated movements, you know, if it's just one extreme or insane guy, like, prattling on about things and reaching, like, 100 people. Uh, that's obviously not going to fix it. Whereas, and then, and this is, I think, why it's important to support the entire chain to actually spread these uh, things as fast as possible. But I, I certainly see that it takes a lot of time. I mean, just just with the with the fire movement, I actually have another bonus slide. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the question is, can you actually make a difference, right? So. Um, so with the fire movement, so do, do scalable emergent movements make a difference? Um, so 10 years ago when I started this, so, so again, like, like things like getting out of Plato's cave of like earn by cycle, stuff like that, uh, it goes back to at least Thoreau, if not longer, you know, this whole crit, crit, criticism of industrialization as a way of life uh, or as a good, good thing. Uh, so it, it tends to go in cycles and it always has an undercurrent and then it gets popular at certain times. Uh, but 10 years ago, like in 2007, when, when I started this, there was only a handful, like literally like five different blogs about this. And, 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 and people could not figure out what, 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 I, what I was going on about. I mean, it's not like I was the first one to invent this by any means, right? But there was so sparse and unknown that nobody uh, knew what early, uh, like extreme early retirement was about. I mean, I was like nominated for awards and like best entrepreneur. It's like what? Uh, or best in senior living? You know, like it's like nuts. <laughs> but about it took. I would say it took about ten years to reach mainstream attention, and that was not me doing the job. That was popular popularized us. So I consider myself somewhat of a trailblazer, like an int intellectual geek about these things, but not someone. Who can relate to to wide groups? So so my role in this I saw as just like doing doing the thought work, so to speak, but not relating as as such. Um, in 2017, it kind of hit mainstream acceptance, and now there's like 500 to a thousand blocks in the world, and we estimate that about one in a hundred to 300 people in the US, again, this is not the entire world. I mean, this is, this is a small thing, right? I mean, it does not extend to like the poorest parts of the world. So this is essentially sort of like a rich person's problem, relatively speaking, as in if you live in the US, you're already in the top 10% of the world, right? But that also means like you're probably the biggest part of the problem, right? So that is where you would attack, you know, like pollution and stuff like that. Um, so we're now like 
where one in 100 to 300 people actually know about this, not just know about it, but actually can in, they can it. So they really integrate it and embody it in their lives. Uh, so based on like your standard, like Dunbar formula, right? Then everybody probably knows one or two people of their colleagues who are secretly planning, you know, like an early, early escape. Um, and Harris Poll did something associated with a broker a few years ago where 11% of their clients, so that's, that's like stock, stock, stock brokers, brokers have actually heard of FIRE and 26% understood what it was, what it's about. So if we do a back of the envelope calculation of this, you know, then we will have about 2 million Americans, right? Uh, and of course, probably twice as many in Europe, maybe, um, doing what the standard recommended 50% savings rate of uh, what is about, you know, like the average income. That would create like a $50 billion a year shift in how money flows around in the economy, which corresponds to about 0.2% of the uh, of the entire economy. So that's not really enough to like, you know, like tip the elephant or move the elephant, but it's certainly something that would get people's attention in that sense. Because, uh, you know, that's 0.2% 0 0 growth rate. That's, that's almost as impactful as an entire ep epidemic. <laughs> Um, likewise, if you sort of add it up, we typically recommend that people save about 30 times their annual expenses, which then become 3% of the entire US market. Again, not an entire market, but it's enough to move things. So we haven't really like changed the beach, but we've certainly like put a breeze in on people questioning all these things. And I would say, especially after the, the COVID lockdowns, it, it got like a huge infusion because people were sort of triggered into really questioning themselves and, and what, their, what their life strategy was all about. Awesome. Oops. All right. Thanks, uh, no. Evan. Um, and so we're going to have to close out here. Um, and so I'll send you the, the, the chats, Jacob. Um, okay. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of good, uh, Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, uh, I, I have a severe case of staircase wit. So if anyone thinks of anything great later, they can send me the question and maybe I'll like incorporate it on like a next talk or something <laughs> like, like with this one. I recommend for all the, the STOA people here or yeah. watching, uh, check out the Jacob's form. It's really one of the best forms on the internet, in my opinion, on uh, early retirement extreme, his blog. Um, so uh, we'll close out here. Uh, any any closing thoughts uh, for us, uh, Jacob, that you'd like to leave uh, the STOA community? Ooh, I mean, not not really beyond the, if you think of something later, you can like uh, contact me. And I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in taking things in, in this direction. So that people already sort of like, thinking along in the same ways i'd be happy to like collaborate again i appreciate the irony here but i mean we try to do what uh, we do, do what we can with 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 what we have because i mean I, I i think this is not the standard way of doing things i mean so i mean like with the with the fire movement this was this was not like some huge government program this was just you know like a, a few individuals that turned into a few dozen individuals who actually made some different outsized outsized difference in in the world so mm. essentially looking for leverage if that's uh, that's probably the best word yeah the the fire movement and uh, particularly your version of it uh is definitely an inspiration for me uh you can check out jacob's book early retirement extreme check out his blog his form um and jacob might be back at the stow in the new year to be a philosopher in residence we'll, we'll, we'll see <laughs> no pressure <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that being said, um, Jacob, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today. Really appreciate it.